Hello, I'm Sofia, and welcome to What We Need to Know About Ukraine. Here, I learn about Ukrainian history, literature, and culture, and share my findings with you. Today's episode is about serfdom in Ukraine. Peasants and serfs are often the neglected part of history, when historians focus on the people that left behind documents and influence. Yet serfdom, a type of forced labor, left a significant mark on Ukraine as well as most of Europe. What is serfdom then, you may ask, and how is it different from slavery? Well, serfdom is a form of peasant servitude and dependence on the upper landowning classes that was characteristic of the feudal system and existed in different parts of Europe from the medieval period to the 19th century. And so it did in Ukraine. How serfs lived and were treated changed with time and country according to natural, economic, social and political conditions. Serfdom is quite similar to slavery, since people are not free and cannot do what they want. There is a misconception that the main difference between the two is that the enslaved peoples have been considered forms of property owned by other people and could be sold and exchanged, but serfs could not be so because they were bound to the land that they occupy from one generation to another. But this was not true, and serfs were sent away, separated from their families, gifted or sold to others, without their consent of course, warning or regard. Serfs were often hit and even murdered. Serfs did not own land and could not move away out of their own volition of course, even if the owner of the land has changed. An actual difference is that the serfs were not taken from another country, were not from a different race or religion, In some places, serfs only needed to do forced labor for a few days or a week, but not in many, and not always. So what did serfs do? The serfs were forced to work the land and inside homes and do really anything. They were even lower than servants on a social scale. And of course, their work was not paid, hence free labor. In Ukraine, serfdom developed first in the territories ruled by Poland. Under the Polish system of serfdom, the peasants were bound uh, by law to their plots of land, which were owned by the lord. The amount of obligatory labor, or corvée, owed by the peasant to the lord depended on the size and quality of the peasant's plot. But the amount of labor effectively exacted was often arbitrary. The Russian Empire system of serfdom, which was established in most Ukrainian territories under the Russian Empire rule at the end of the 18th century, was based on the principle that the lord owned the peasant under his control. He could dispose of his serfs as he wished. He could even separate them from their land. The amount of labor owed by the peasants and the size of their allotments depended on the number of adult males in their families. Serfdom was practiced differently and in different regions of Ukraine when it was occupied by, or part of, different states, or indeed during different times in its history. Serfdom looked different and was even called differently. For example, in the Kyivan Rus, serfdom was not really serfdom at all. It was called panshina in Ukrainian and that is stemming from the word lord. And in English, there is not a direct translation, but the closest word for panshina, I think, is vilain. In short, panshina is a medieval form of land rent payment, when a peasant has the obligation to work for the landowner for a certain amount of time for the right to use a piece of land and to provide for his own life needs. This peasant is not owned by the lord. This panshina started in Ukraine during the Kyivan Rus. The bulk of the peasants lived on their own land and paid tribute in kind or money to the ruling prince. But they sometimes had to provide unpaid labor for the construction of fortifications and roads and in emergencies were called to bear arms in a levy and mass. Panshina started to evolve into serfdom during the Ukraine being part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. I think it is fair to remind everyone that it was comprised of three equal states, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Grand Duchy of Rus or Ruthenia, that is Ukraine, and the Kingdom of Poland. So, in the second half of the 15th and in the 16th centuries, the position of the peasantry in Ukrainian territories changed radically. In Poland, allodial land ownership was already an established privilege of the ruling class. The nobility had been exempted from any form of conditional land tenure, 
and the peasants have been deprived of their former rights to land. The Polish nobles extended their serf system to western Ukraine and, in 1569, to the right bank of Ukraine as well. The nobles, four diets, the first one being in 1496 and the last one in 1520, issued decrees tying peasants ever more closely to the land, depriving them of the right to move, subjecting them completely to the nobles' courts and increasing their obligations to the nobles. Finally, the amount of labor owed by the serfs and uh, all other matters affecting them were left to the decision of the nobles, their tenants, or their stewards. A uniform system of serf obligations and relations was maintained on the royal estates, where serfs received better treatment than on private estates of the nobility. The obligations imposed on the serfs rose steeply in cases where a tenant, not the landowner, managed the estate. Although the plots of the serfs gradually shrank, their obligations were not lowered. To receive an allotment, there needed to be a draft corvée with ox or horse. A corvée, like I said, is a form of unpaid forced labor that is intermittent in nature, lasting for limited periods of time, typically only a certain number of days of work each year or each week. The larger plots required corvée with a pair of animals, such as oxes or horses, who could work the land. Depending on the period and the locality, the amount of corvée varied from three to six days per week by one or more members of the household. The poorer serfs, with smaller or no field allotments, provided one to six days of pedestrian corvée per week, and that means working uh, the field without an animal to help. The weekly corvée quota, so to say, other seasonal or special forms of labor and additional dues in kind or cash varied with the territory and even the estate, as did the size of the allotments. In the 1620s, corvée on magnates' estates in Volinia came to four to six days per week in 16.8 uh, hectares of land, but some lords demanded labor every day of the week, including holidays. If we move farther east, the surf plots become larger and the corvée becomes smaller, and the bond to the plot grows weaker. In the 16th and 17th centuries, there were three distinct serfdom belts in Ukrainian territories. In western Ukraine, the peasants were exploited intensely and had the smallest allotments in the middle belt encompassing eastern Podilia and the northwestern Kyiv region. Uh, mixed allodial and conditional land tenure lasted longer, and the large landowners were usually content to receive payment in kind, and the peasants were not completely or uniformly deprived of the right to own land. And then in the third belt, covering the lands along the Dnipro River and the Boch River in southwestern Ukraine, serfdom was difficult to impose because of the proximity of the steppes and the constant danger of Tatar attack. The population was way too mobile. North of the defensive line of castles, many estates in the second and third belts offered uh, 15, 20, or 30 year waivers from Corway um, and other obligations in order to attract and hold settlers. But parts of Ukraine were also part of other countries, for example, Austria and Moldova. Galicia and Bukovina experience a lighter form of serfdom under the Austrian rule. To increase tax revenues and improve the recruit pool for the army in the newly annexed lands, Maria Theresa and Joseph II tried to regulate lord serf relations and to limit the dependence of the peasant on the landowner. In the 1780s, a cadaster and a survey of serf obligations were carried out. The land belonging to landowners was separated from the rustical lands reserved for the peasants, and transfers from one category to the other were prohibited. The serf's personal dependency on the lord was restricted, and he was allowed to appeal to state institutions against the lord's verdicts. Corvée was limited to a fixed number of days depending on the size of the land allotment, and additional burdens were abolished. The peasant acquired the right to sell his products freely. Village communities were given new powers of self-government. A special mandator, or abudsman, uh, was appointed to look after the affairs of the peasants. Many of the reforms were ignored, of course, by the successors of Joseph II, but something was still done in a positive way. 
Under Moldovan rule, the peasants in Bukovina usually perform 12 days of corvée per year and pay the lord one-tenth of their harvest, but they were free to move. The serf system introduced in 1544 was less exploitive than the Polish one, and as a result, many peasants from Pokutia and Podilia escaped to Bukovina. In 1749, this was abolished, and um, a 24 days of corvée per year and a tax was established. According to the Golden Charter of Voivod Gika in 1766, peasants were obligated to do 12 days of corvée and to surrender one-tenth of their harvest, and this law was in effect until 1848. As the serfs became increasingly exploited in the western and middle belt, and as the corvée waivers expired and were foreshortened by the landowners, the peasants fled to territories under Cossack control and joined Cossack uprisings, or the Hetmanid state. There was little to no serfdom under the Cossacks, and even that little part could not really be called serfdom, but more panchina. Those conditions contributed to the Cossack-Polish War that started in 1648. The peasantry participated in the war on a mass scale. Some of the peasant combatants joined the Cossack ranks along with the new Cossacks from the other estates uh, and demanded open access to land and other Cossack privileges. Former serfs who failed to gain admission to the Cossack estate took possession of the free lands and the liberated territories. Generally, peasant obligations in the Hetman stage during the second half of the 17th and beginning of 18th century were light. The serf lord relation and the corvée dependent on the kind of village and on its owner. A large number of peasants who performed corvée for the state could own property. Many peasants from western Ukraine and right bank of Ukraine, which were retained by Poland, fled to the Hetman state uh, or to Slovitska Ukraine. Most of them settled as landless peasants on the estates of the Cossack Starshina or monasteries. And according to the 1729-1730 census of the Hetman state, only 35% of the peasant farmers were subject to private landowners, and not all of those were required to perform forced unpaid labor. Hetman Ivan Mazepa's Universal in 1701 prohibited more than two days corvée per week, and in 1740s they could still move from one landowner to another, but had to leave their property, be that land and inventory, behind. Finally, the most famous and harsh form of serfdom that Ukraine has experienced was during the Russian Empire. By the decree of 3rd of May, 1783, Catherine II introduced the Russian Empire serf system in the territory of the former Hetman state. After the second and third partitions of Poland, the Russian Empire serf system was extended to the right bank of Ukraine. According to official estimates made in 1858, 60% of serfs belonged to landowners and 40 lived on a state or a penage lands. Of the landowner serfs, only 1.2% paid quit rent, and the rest did corvée. State peasants usually paid quit rent or rent that replaced tribute, and they would do so in money or grains, furs, honey, livestock, etc. During the first half of the 19th century, the land allotted to peasants diminished, corvée increased, and the number of landless peasants rose sharply. Corvée rose to an average of between four and six labor days per week. The so-called norm system of labor was widely adopted. Many peasants lost their land and worked only on their lord's demands for a monthly ration of products. Others became household serfs who worked and lived in the lord's manor. The landowners increased corvée to cover the state-imposed taxes, different types of them. In a separate manifesto in 1797, the Russian Empire government proposed that the landowners limit their demands on the peasants to a three-day corvée, but in the 19th century, serfdom took on particularly crude forms. In 1819, it clarified some aspects of the serf-lord relationship. Those and other manifestos were largely ignored by landowners, though. 
In 1847-8, the government issued the so-called inventory regulations for the right bank of Ukraine, which diminished the personal dependence of the peasants on their masters, lowered the corvée, and regulated it according to the household allotments, prohibited the transfer of corvée from one week and another, abolished certain payments, and prohibited military court. But the position of the serfs did not change. The abolition of the serfs in the Russian Empire was a political repercussion of the Crimean War and brought on the emancipation of the serfs in February 1861. But the redemption payments and the continued social inequality of the peasants diminished the impact of those reforms and hindered the economic progress of the peasantry. We then understand that in the Russian Empire the realistic limits of corvée and treatment of the serfs was not like those on paper. In fact, serfs, on practice, were objects of their owners and completely without rights. A landowner could sell a serf, exchange it for any property, separate a husband from a wife and parents from their children, make a serf do forced labor without the right to appeal. Their children inherited their debts, so their children were also born as serfs. It really didn't matter what the law said about the amount of corvée days, that one could have, since if your lord tells you to go and do work, you are going to go and do it. In many cases, a serf had to work for the landowner, and then he had to take care of his own food and housing in his free time from the lord, and of course this was not nearly enough time. I think one of the best ways to feel what people felt at the time is through literature. Markovovchok, a famous Ukrainian author, wrote many stories about serfdom and many other things. I will leave a link to a collection of her short stories in the English translation in the description. In a story called Horpina, she writes about a woman named Horpina who was a serf. And I will quote a little bit from that story. Misery, however, did not pass her, Horpina, by. Her little daughter became ill. She screamed and cried. Orpuna cried along with her, but there was nothing she could do to help her. The old father-in-law ran to the village midwife, but she was not at home. There were not even any women about to help. They were all in the field. Soon, Orpuna had to go to the field as well. Why don't you go? They sent to ask her. My child is ill, she said in tears. You must work for the master. He could not care less about your child, was the reply. And she had to go. She took her daughter, bundled her up, and off she went. The poor little one screamed all the time. When they reached the field, the master met her himself. He was so angry. Mother of God, have mercy on us. He began to give her a tongue lashing. The child in her arms screamed and kicked. The master became angrier than ever. Away with that child, out with it, he shouted. You have to work, not fuss with the child. He ordered the section foreman to take the child home. Oh, dear master, at least let me take her home myself, begged Horpuna tearfully. My dear master, be merciful, this is my only child. Take it, take it, he said to the foreman. And you, he said to Horpuna, will do your work if you don't want to be punished. They took the child across the field. For a long time, Horpuna heard its cry, pitiful and pained. Then it grew fainter and fainter and finally died away. Another story by Markovovchok is Cossack Girl, where a wealthy Cossack girl marries a serf out of love and becomes one herself. She is then mistreated and so are her children. The Cossack girl and her husband are also forcefully separated. The last story of Markovovchok I want to mention, and I recommend you read them all, is called Odarka and is told from the perspective of Odarka's aunt. The story is about a little girl that gets separated from her parents, since they are serfs, even though she is not of age. Of course, she gets separated from her parents because she is gifted to somebody else. Quote, Just when he, the master, asked about Odarka, we froze. And just at that moment, Odarka herself came in. At the sight of her, his eyes glittered, and he said, Let us go to the manor, girl. Odarka ran to her mother and stood near her, poor child afraid to breathe. She has not yet come of age, she has only turned fifteen, said her father. Her mother began to cry. 
Say just one more word, you rash fellow, and you are for it, the master stored him. Then he addressed Odarka once more. Get a move on Odarka, let us go. But she stood stock still. Hurry, girl. She stood there dumbfounded. He grabbed her and led her away. It was as if our sun had set. It was as if the house had immediately become empty and desolate. We put up with it till the evening. In the evening, my brother's wife went to the manor to find out what had happened, but soon returned. They did not let me go to Odarka, she said, and I neither saw any sign of her nor heard her voice, and she began to weep bitterly. For a long time, we did not see our child. They did not allow the father or mother or myself to see her. We would go and stand about at the manor gates, and without seeing her, we would return home, feeling embittered against the whole world. End of quote. It was for three weeks that Odarka was gone when she managed to escape back to her family for one night, and she told them of all the threatening and beating she endured of being locked up. Quote, she spent the night at home. It seemed that she had scarcely closed her eyes when the servant lads from the manor came for her. Come, quickly! How she pleaded and how she begged tearfully to be allowed to stay for a while in her father's house, since she was not feeling well at all. No, they said, we cannot allow this. If you will not come willingly, we will, as ordered, take you by force. The lady guests and the young ladies have been looking for you since last night. It looks as if some other misfortune is on the way, said my brother's wife. God forbid. It would have been better if she had died young, responded my brother. Stop crying, Odarka, stop it, he said. Stop pleading. These lads cannot be appealed to. They are just carrying out their orders. It is not up to us, said the youth. They began to also feel sorry. Oh, uncle, if only it were up to us. We were worried about what was going to happen next. We did not know what we should do. Should we go to the manor or await our fate at home? Just then, at noon, Odarka put in an appearance. Farewell, mother, farewell. We rushed to her. What is the matter? What has happened? They have given me to a young master and his lady, she said. They will take me away next week, and aunt, they will take you as well. They said we have until Sunday to get ready. A chill ran through my heart. I have not lived a life of luxury. I had nevertheless lived with my family in my own house. Now they were giving me to strangers, sending me to strange surroundings. What had I done to deserve such treatment? I became very sad and gave way to a flood of bitter tears. My brother's wife was thankful to God that Odarka was not going away alone. End of quote. But not all Ukrainian serfs were completely without a voice. The most famous Ukrainian serf is, without a doubt, the world-famous poet and artist, the Ukrainian bard Taras Shevchenko. Shevchenko was born into serfdom, but was a brilliant artist, and a group of wealthy people paid a small fortune to buy Shevchenko out of serfdom. He went on to write a huge collection of poems, 237 of them in total, and most are quite long, to say the least, as well as a few plays, as well as drawings and paintings. Shevchenko's traditions in depicting the tragic fate of serfs in some of his poems, in particular female serfs, were continued by Markovovchok, who we just talked about. Shevchenko called Markovovchok a prophet and really enjoyed her work. Shevchenko was part of what is called by the term the serf intelligentsia in Ukraine. This group of people have gone from serfdom to freedom and then to becoming famous writers, historians, architects, and inventors. Serfdom was a large part of Ukrainian history, and really the only time that serfdom was minimal or non-existent before its abolition throughout Europe would be when Ukraine was fully in control of its own land, people, and laws. Serfdom was brutal and affected more people than one might think. Let us remember then the stories of Markovovchok to prevent people's rights, freedoms, and sovereignty from being taken over in the future.
Thank you so much for joining me today. And this was What We Need to Know About Ukraine this week. Thank you.